Well, hi there, Internet. It's been a little while since I uh, put a video up. I've had some hardware issues. They've been a pain in the ass, to be honest. So what's happened is, well, Windows 8, which I'm currently recording on, uh, at some point after the new year, it missed some update, but then it got consequent updates. So eventually, something updated about a fortnight ago now and it needed some of the old stuff and then something broke somehow and the desktop no longer worked and the installer no longer worked so I couldn't uninstall or reinstall anything uh, so I had to start with a completely fresh install of Windows 8 and try and start again and then that didn't work for some reason uh, I don't know why I still don't know why so I just used Linux more and more uh, which I still do, but I've recently uh, been bothered to put up with Windows 8 again. Don't buy it. Whatever you do, don't buy it. And I've reinstalled on this machine, so I dual boot Linux and Windows and trying to use Windows as little as possible. And now that I've got that all figured out, that is why I haven't uploaded a video in a while. And I'm sorry, Internet. I've let you down. Anyway, so today... Uh, quick little story which you know well but I've got some stuff you probably haven't heard uh, for unless you've and, and I'll just I'll just read it and then and then I'll go on about it so this is in mark 11 where right after the triumphant entry where Jesus and his disciples rock up at Jerusalem and uh, if you don't know the triumphant entries um, has a lot of parallels in the Old Testament and Jesus everyone's happy to see him in Jerusalem and people kind of start singing and dancing and they're very happy and they he rides in on a donkey and they have palm leaves and they wave them and it's very happy <clears throat> so that's the first part of chapter 11 of the book of Mark and then from verse 11 there's two story two things that happen two stories but one story is wrapped in another so like we start with one story and then the author switches and then he switches back so it goes like this then he entered Jerusalem and went into the temple and when he had looked around at everything as it was already late he went out to Bethany with the twelve on the following day when they came from Bethany he was hungry seeing in the distance a fig tree in leaf he went to see whether perhaps he would find anything on it when he came to it he found nothing but leaves for it was not the season for figs he said to it may no one ever eat fruit from you again and his disciples heard it. Then they came to Jerusalem, and he entered the temple and began to drive out those who were selling and those who were buying in the temple. And he overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold doves, and he would not allow anyone to carry anything through the temple. He was teaching and saying, Is it not written? And he quotes, My house shall be called a house of prayer for all the nations, but you have made it a stronghold for bandits. And when the chief priests and the scribes heard it, they kept looking for a way to kill him, for they were afraid of him, because the whole crowd was spellbound by his teaching. And when evening came, Jesus and his disciples went out of the city. In the morning as they passed by, they saw the fig tree withered away to its roots. Then Peter remembered and said to him, Rabbi, look, the fig tree that you cursed is withered. Jesus answered them, Have faith in God. Truly I tell you, if you say to this mountain, Be taken up and thrown into the sea, and if you do not doubt in your heart, but believe that what you say will come to pass, it will be done for you. So I tell you, whatever you ask for in prayer, believe that you have received it, and it will be yours. And then he goes on about a few other things. But there, it starts with a little story about the fig tree, verse 11. And then, then there's the story of him disturbing the temple and upsetting everyone. Uh, and then it goes back to the fig tree again. So, and, th and this is right after where Jesus walks in, comes in on the, on the donkey and... So there's a whole bunch of things you can say about that. Um, I suppose I'd start by saying that with everything in the Bible, it's not the Bible wasn't written to actually be read. It's written to be listened to because most people are illiterate and uh, you have someone to read these things out to you. And so the positioning of stuff becomes very, very important in a spoken word document. So you have this story and then it changes to this one and then it changes back to the first one. And that comes like things when things are right next to each other, that's important. Uh, so Fee and Stuart see the triumphant. They see the three events of, of Jesus 
coming into Jerusalem as like an echo of Isaiah chapter 35, which you can go look at if you like. And uh, so it starts with the, the triumphant entry on the donkey, Jesus' only destructive miracle where he curses the fig tree and it dies, and then the driving out of the of the money changes. Uh, <clears throat> there's two th- theories that I've, well, two explanations I've heard of with Jesus driving out all the all the um, the animals and the people doing business in the temple, and they, they were both around supposed rorts that went on back then. So one is with with the with the sem- the sacrificial system, I guess you call it. You go in, and if you don't have livestock, if you don't live on a farm, or you don't, you might live on a farm but not own the livestock because your employer does. And you go to the the temple in Jerusalem to worship. You don't have your own animals, so you have to buy them from somewhere. And so way back in the Old Testament, they set that up with the original temple. In fact, I think even with the original tabernacle before the temple. But anyway, uh, they set it up, Moses set it up so that people could buy a, a dove or two and it would be an approved animal and they could use that in their sacrifice and that'd all be legit. Uh, <clears throat> but what happens is a thousand or so years later is you have Roman occupation and in in the Roman Empire the official currency is is the Roman I think it was the Greek drachma at the time but in the temple the religious authorities would only accept the temple shekel so in order to buy the animal first you had to to go to a foreign exchange place which was right at the temple and you had to switch your money over and then use the temple money to buy the temple animal to make your sacrifice and so the first rort was that these exchange rates were just exorbitantly high and and the same the amount of money you could you could buy 10 doves for the price in regular money than what you could get in temple money so that's the first rort. the second one is kind of um how does it work it you go in and buy an animal no sorry say you bring an animal into the temple and you uh, you want to make a sacrifice with it so in the Jewish law there's all this rule about uh, all these qualifications about what makes an appropriate animal and like no blemishes it's got to have all its legs and all its horns and it has to be healthy and all the rest of that so the priest would inspect it before letting you letting you use it as a sacrifice and so apparently what there was a bit of a racket going on where the priest would refuse a lot of animals uh, and then they'd make you buy one of theirs and then what would happen is they would take the one they refused and hide it in the back wait till you were gone bring out the ones they refused from the day before and sell them to people the next day as approved animals even though they'd been disapproved and taken away the day before and they could get away with it because they were the religious authorities so they like they religious religion and politics typically have been fused throughout history right this idea of the separation of church and state is relatively new um but you know temple and state and mosque and state and uh and the caste and state have always been fused through most societies but in roman times they would kind of the romans would let you handle your religious affairs however you wanted they didn't really care about that they just wanted their tax money and they wanted you to not make uh, a fuss and they'd pretty much leave you alone <clears throat> so so this is how the the temple authorities could get away with these rorts even under roman occupation if you were a local you couldn't get any advocacy from the from the government uh, <clears throat> and then so those you'd have to look into them the the one about the recycling the animals i learnt from a um dr greg boyd a pastor at um at St. Paul's Church. Is that the name of his church? I don't know. You can look him up. And the exchange rates one, I've I read in commentary somewhere a long time ago. But the other thing at the time is that uh, King Herod built, uh, he built a lot of stuff. He built, he, he had a massive ego and needed to compensate for something most likely. Uh, so he built lots of things. And uh, the Jewish temple at the time was extended by him and you got this thing called the court of gentiles or the outer court of gentiles and it's referred to at one or two points throughout the gospels so in the original temple it's pretty strict gentiles were never allowed in and um it was not a huge building 
but uh, it it had the necessary ne the necessary stalls for people to come from from interstate, I guess, and buy an animal if they needed, and all the facilities, and and it had what it needed. But then Herod turned it into this massive monolithic structure, and it and it had an outer court of the Gentiles, and this was full of markets and things, and uh, <clears throat> and and more money changes, and just lots of lots of business going on. And that's not the purpose of the temple. So a lot of scholars, uh, including the translators for the NRSV, which I just read from, uh, will tell you that uh, a lot of Jesus' protest was around taking the temple and not and not focusing on it primarily for its spiritual uses, but its commercial, because the outer court of the Gentiles was, I guess, probably their ancient equivalent of a shopping center, a shopping mall. <clears throat> And I think they're probably right. And then the other thing is that phrase that Jesus quotes, you've turned it into a stronghold for bandits, or you might have commonly heard it as a, you've turned it into a den of thieves, is uh, another, um, oh, where does that come from? It's probably Jeremiah. Actually, it should be in the footnotes. Let me get it for you. But you have made it a den of robbers. Den of robbers, Jesus. So Jeremiah 7 would be where you want to look for that. Anyway, so that, that there is a fairly fairly common criticism for, of authorities, not just Jewish authorities, but all cultures. But in Jeremiah, uh, he criticized the religious authorities for taking money from people and enjoying social privilege and then um, sheltering up behind their temple walls and behind their positions of influence and not being accountable and all of that kind of thing. So he's cut about that, and he has a go at them. Uh, with the with the tree, the fig tree story. Well, uh, you might know uh, that the Bible has a lot of a lot of images and symbolism and things represent things. So with the fig tree, it's usually equated to oh the phone. Hello, hang on. <laughs> I never have my phone off silent, and that's not oh, it's some telemarketer locked number at right at five o'clock yeah yeah i don't want to buy whatever it is you're selling so uh the fig tree there represents israel generally and israel's spiritual leaders and israel's leaders specifically so when jesus enters so this is right after the triumphant entry on the donkey jesus comes in sees the tr sees the fig tree and curses it because it's got no fruit on it so this is a, a kind of symbolic prophetic denunciation of of the Jewish leaders rule because they weren't bearing fruit in Jesus opinion and the other thing that's funny about this story is it even says that it's not Jesus goes looking for fruit on the tree it even says it's not the season for figs and he curses it and I've always thought that was unfair uh, but in um, in my commentary the Kena one the IVP New Testament one uh, he writes that the, the, these fig trees have a, a first fruit so the main season was actually later in the year but you can tell if, if a fig tree was going to produce fruit that year by, the, by, by inspecting it at this time when it has leaves on it but no fruit and usually they'll have little fruits on them but it's not the main harvest so Jesus was looking for the first fruits there were none so he cursed it and then he comes back later and it turns out that it's dead and, and, and withered it's the only Every other miracle Jesus does is helpful and it brings life. It's healing or it's food or it's setting someone free from demons or, um, you know, some very useful insight. This is the only thing, the only time where it's not. So, yeah, there you go. Jesus shows, demonstrates his authority to destroy things as well as, as, well as create them. So it's a great big prophetic statement against Jesus, against um, the Jewish Jewish leaders. And then the other thing, the other half of of the story, which you don't hear, is why why the rabbis would why the rabbis and what's the phrase, religious leaders, chief priests and scribes, they were looking for a way to kill him. Verse eighteen. Yeah. So that pops up throughout the later half of the Gospels, uh, where Jesus has made a name for himself and he's stirring up the crowd, because back then. You have to be really careful of the mob and anyone who raises a mob because under Roman occupation, uh, you'll get crushed. And the Romans didn't discriminate between 
who started the mob and the riot and who tried to stop it. They'll just kill everyone and make an example out of everyone. And the ruling authorities know this. And so on one hand, you could say they were just jealous because Jesus was a successful preacher or, you know, they were... They hated him because he called them out on their on their faults and their lies and their hypocrisy. And I think that's true. But at the same time, they also had a position where they knew what the government would do and they they, they could kind of see what would happen if if the mob kind of got behind Jesus and started disturbing the peace. And and even like a hundred or so years before Jesus' time, there had been riots. The Jews were successful for a time, but that was against a much smaller empire before the Romans came. Uh, <clears throat> so they're thinking, well, crap, like it's getting up to Passover time. Religious sentiment is very high. People are getting excited. There's this guy, Jesus, seems to be getting a lot of attention. Uh, he seems to call us out a lot and seems to be against our rule. Uh, he says Caesar isn't the king. There's, you know, so that all is very politically charged. And they're thinking, well, if we want to live this year and not get crushed by the Roman government again, we better do something about this Jesus guy and so then they think kill him very very interesting thing and you don't hear that much uh, the religious leaders get written off as the bad guy in these stories and and like strictly speaking I can see I can see Jesus point of view and I totally agree but uh, at the other end like they're being politically expedient and trying not to get killed because the Romans, I, I know I said this before, but they'll kill everyone. Like they'll, they would have killed Jesus and his followers and the, his big crowd of disciples that followed him and just random people on the street who were trying to stay out of it and their families and the, they would have, they're indiscriminate. It would have been a massacre and the religious leaders knew this. Anyway, so yeah, we've mentioned the fig tree, the riot, the theories of money changing and recycling animals. Suppose I guess the only other thing that really matters here with Herod's extensions to the temple is that with these ancient societies, and especially with Judaism, is the temple is a real center for the whole nation and a center for their society. It's a political and religious hub, and everything goes on there. So anything that happens around the temple, when you read the Bible, you, you want to see it as, I guess, very significant or more significant. It's like a statement on the status of god or the status of god's people you could take it as i guess yeah that's all i wanted to say that whole that whole bit is mark chapter 11 up to verse 24 25 and the and the fig tree story starts at verse 11 anyway i've been acoustic pants hope you enjoyed the video please subscribe if you did and i will see you next time triumphant entries um has a lot of parallels in the old testament and jesus everyone's happy to see him in jerusalem and people kind of start singing and dancing and they're very happy and they he rides in on a donkey and they have palm leaves and they wave them and it's very happy <clears throat> so that's the first part of chapter 11 of the book of mark and then from verse 11 there's two story two things that happen two stories but one story is wrapped i still don't know why so i just used linux more and more uh which i still do but I've recently uh, been bothered to put up with Windows 8. Don't buy it. Whatever you do, don't buy it. And I've reinstalled on this machine. So I dual boot Linux and Windows and trying to use Windows as little as possible. And now that I've got that all figured out, that is why I haven't uploaded a video in a while. And I'm sorry, Internet. I've let you down. Anyway, so today... Uh, quick little story which you know well but I've got some stuff you probably haven't heard uh, for unless you've and, and I'll just I'll just read it and then and then I'll go on about it so this is in mark 11 where right after the triumphant entry where Jesus and his disciples rock up at Jerusalem and uh, if you don't know the tri well hi there internet it's been a little while since I uh, put a video up I've had some hardware issues They've been a pain in the ass, to be honest. So what's happened is, well, Windows 8, which I'm currently recording on, uh, at some point after the new year, it missed some update, but then it got consequent updates. So eventually something 
updated about a fortnight ago now and it needed some of the old stuff and then something broke somehow and the desktop no longer worked and the installer no longer worked so I couldn't uninstall or reinstall anything uh, so I had to start with a completely fresh install of Windows 8 and try and start again and then that didn't work for some reason uh, I don't know why 